Put your mic on. Good evening and welcome to the April 15th regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, we ask that everybody in the audience turn off their cell phones if you have them on. And if you could stand and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight we start a little early because we have a budget workshop. So uh, would you, uh, Scott, take roll for our budget workshop? Of course. President Singer. Here. Secretary Baker. Treasurer Friedel. Here. Member Blasey. Member Lauterbach. Member Rush. Here. We do have a quorum. Four of us. Okay. Well, I'm glad we've got four of us here. There's five. All right. Thank are you. Are you done yet? <laughs> Come on in and join us. We have Mr. Blazy that uh, just walked in, so we'll go ahead and add him to our roll call for our budget workshop. Uh, we're moving into item two, which is a request to address the board uh, regarding the budget workshop. Do I have anyone in the audience that would like to request uh, to address the board? Okay, seeing none, we will go into item three, which is uh, board discussion and prioritization for the 2018-19 general fund budget. Um, Bob, are you going to lead us through this? Absolutely. I'll take you on through it. And like you said, it's a budget workshop. So if you have questions as we go, please feel free to ask. Um, I'd like to tell you, give you lots of information. But it's like the first year in a while, I can't tell you as much information because the state still does not have any funding out there as early as we've at least seen the proposals in the past. But let me run through. I thought I'd start just a slight PowerPoint. So not very long here for you. But as you remember the process here, we did our budget uh, uh, revision on March 18th, the last board meeting. We're now to the budget workshop here in April. And then we'll actually do the proposed 1920 budget um, on June 10th. And we'd follow that up on the 24th with the adoption of that budget. And of course, we'll do the budget adjustment on 1819 one more time. So. Between now and that June 10th date, we'll take all the information we have, all the priorities we've established, and come up with a budget to give you at that time. Um, it is possible, and as, as we talk about it tonight, I'll try to remind you that, but it's very possible. It's been a long time, like even before I came but to this position, but we have adopted budgets before when the state does not have the funding determined in June. And that's not a, it used to be the norm and not the rarity that it's been the last four or five years. So if we have to do that, typically we try to be very conservative. And the only thing I would tell you is most likely um, if they did it after that time, you could have a budget adjustment in the first part of the year. That's what they typically used to do. In other words, you adopt a budget in June, you find out what the state's going to do in September or October for sure. And then in October, November, you'll have one. You won't do a full adjustment of your budget, but typically you'll adjust the revenue. Um, you might make it November, December only because you might be waiting for your student count to be more accurate. Uh, because let's face it, those two things, what the state's going to fund is per pupil. And the student count are the major things that bring in the revenue. The state fiscal year is actually October 1, October 1. And so that was the norm as you usually would get it right before October. And we even had one year, if you recall, we were shut down for 24 hours in October. So. Um, that's just a snapshot out of the uh, last presentation I gave you, so you can kind of know where we are in the 1819 uh, general fund. And as you know, we did a little bit of adjustment there, still look to uh, be able to put some money back into the fund equity here. Um, at the March adjustment, it was 1.2. And again, depending on the variance, we'll come back to you at the end of June so you know uh, how much you have in there. Again, I want to remind you that when you see the percent of expenditures at the bottom, everybody's always interested in that. But that 23.5% that we gave you in that adjustment includes uh, donations that are restricted. And it also includes those parts we've assigned. If you remember, we're siloing off some money for copiers and also for uh, technology. So in fact, I think you'll see some of that coming up. The big things we talk about always, and when we go to put a budget together, Lori and I and everybody else that's involved have been going through a series of meetings. Um, we look at the state and local funding. That those are the revenue factors. And so the state has both involved in it the foundation allowance that you're used to hearing about, which is how much am I going to get per pupil? And you're also going to hear about the categorical aids. There's lots of different categories that they put money into. 
and so they can increase one and take away in the other and that we don't turn out so good on that one but it also can work in our favor so like uh, the year they added 31a money that was money we had never had before and so we kind of got a double uh, benefit there the local includes of course everything we raise plus the enhancement millage uh, there's uh, isd transfers back and forth for the special education and then finally the grants and we are becoming more and more a state of grants though some of those grants are fluctuating wildly especially the ones that come from the federal government um, they look like those are going to be a lot lower this coming year um, just because of how they're setting their priorities for spending on the expenditure side basically i like to break it into two categories um, you have personnel costs and so it's the compensation you're going to give them the cost of benefits staffing levels fit in there too because well, you know how many positions we have how do we fill them and the retirement part is just as much as new hires it's really a balancing act um, they can make a big difference if you're an older staff you're typically paying higher wages younger staff you're paying lower wages and so sometimes that's just an effect of where you are in the age of your teaching staff and the other part the 14 percent we'll go through a, a, a process i think you've heard me talk about balancing our budgets, which they talk about the Bob meetings, which is not me, but it's balance our budgets. We started a long time ago where they come in, talk about their needs in their building, and we kind of go through that. We do buildings and departments. Um, the buildings is relatively easy to do because they, they, you know, they have their amounts that they have, and we talk about what they can spend it on. The departments are more like curriculum, could be technology, could be maintenance, and those uh, areas. So it could be everything from um, textbooks, uh, professional development, teaching and office supplies, purchase services, um, fees and licenses, technology, furniture equipment, and of course utility and, and fuel, which are, you know, can be big costs. Uh, we've had a good run on fuel costs too, which looks like it's heading up again, but we've had a pretty nice run on, on those kinds of things. So those are the areas that we look at. I um, always like to, let me click out of that for a minute, if it comes back, here we go. I always like to go from there to um, the state bulletin, uh, 1014. And what I've got here for you is the state every year comes and uh, gives you information on a per, a per pupil basis, uh, ranks you in the state. And so in the black here, I've got 1718. We're back here in the blues, 1415, just so you can see it over time. Uh, they had 825 uh, school districts, and they rank them. This is for last year's data. So they always do it a year behind. Um, I always like to look at the revenue sources to start with. And so you can see the local sources, state sources, and total. Um, you can see out here how much it is. And this, again, is all ranked as a per pupil spending. So what I would show you is that locally, 138. Notice it's in the ballpark. We, um, we have the tax base, and so we stay strong locally. Remember, this is a balancing act. When you come up with that foundation allowance, Whatever you can raise locally through your taxation, that's part of it, and the state makes up the difference. So it shouldn't surprise you that our state sources are much less, uh, 679th out of those 825, and that's just the balancing act between the two. When you put all the sources together, including um, you could have uh, federal grants in there too, all those sources uh, were 271. I would point out on the total sources, you know, one time we were 191, we're now at 271. Part of that is that, um, say, the effect of the 2x formula that's been going on. So it's not that we're still not out there, but when you start to look at the other districts, they're just compressing where we all are. And so it's easy to, you, you might say, boy, that's a long jump from if you look back 248 to 271. Mm -hmm. But it's really not. I mean, you're all packed in there really tight per pupil. So it doesn't take much. But that's one of the effects as we've gone through time of the difference in funding with Prop A and the 2x is the state's grown, so they're growing at quite a rate there. Um, then how do we use our money? These are expenditures, and so if I look at instructional programs and it's broken down into basic programs, that's the general classroom. Uh, the added programs, that would be special education plus um, other ones on, on, on the outside. Total instruction and then instructional salaries and benefits. And what you'll see is um, 295 ranking for basic programs, 220, for added programs, 244 for total instruction, and 217 for instructional salaries and benefits. And to be very honest, to explain all of those, if you come down to instructional salaries and benefits, uh, in 14-15 we were 74th in the state, and now we're 217. Almost a direct reflection of the younger staff that we've taken on. Um, and, and, and we did a lot of 
we did a lot of things in that time to also get our expenditures and revenues in balance. But it's basically the younger staff is, you're going to change it, and that does reflect it. I think those numbers are still important, though, because I always want to look the other place. People always want to know about our support services. Hey, Bob, so what, is, yeah. what is the, with the rank, if we're 295, that's 295 out of? Uh, 825. That's 825. Right. So about a quarter. It's a little more than that. Okay. And if you go back up one more, Bob, again, remind you that our revenue is 271. So we're in, we're, our expenditures are in the realm of where we should be by revenue as well. And that's shifted. We've had to adjust to that. Yep. And you would have seen back here. Look, look where we were in, in those times and then where we were here. When you go for the support services, we have the instructional side. It means everything from counselors to our curriculum specialists and so on and so forth. Um, you'll see that stayed relatively the same. It's 198 now. Uh, that's what you'd want. I would argue with you that what you're seeing here is that, that you've done a good job as a board keeping the money closest to the students because when you look at the other two areas, which is if you take the business and administration of the district, you'll see that it's 777. And if you take the operations and the maintenance of the district, it's 678. Now, you could argue a little bit going from 709 to 678 is the effect of the bond taking over some of that, but still, uh, you'll see you try to put most of your money towards the instructional programs um, that we have, and that's what you should do. You're taking the resources that you have and you're trying to place them in the place that makes the most sense. Again, 271 was your revenue, 198 is your instruction, so you're putting a higher emphasis there. Right. Yep. All right. So what do the state aid proposals look like? Well, I only have one column, and I always usually have all the columns filled in for you by this time. So that's going to be the first thing that's going to be a little different. <clears throat> and the governor's proposal is enough different that even some of it's, a, it's not fleshed out, really, because until the House and the Senate come out, then they all start talking about what that really means. So even as, uh, if you go at, to the very top here, the foundation allowance, um, we currently get... Uh, uh, we will be getting, excuse me, 8651 under the governor's proposal, which is another $120 uh, per student. Um, the governor's proposal is a 1.5x formula, which they, in other words, we're going to get more under her proposal. Um, I would have my doubts if that will fly all the way through the House and the Senate. A, a 2x could still be there, and I would think they'll still push for that to catch them up. Uh, her thought was the 1.5 kind of help some of the districts like ourselves that have been getting the one side of that all the time instead of the, the twice as much. Um, when I say it, it's really not fleshed out, this is a great example because back here, currently, we're getting $8,531 a student. But if you remember, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but it, it, in some places it looks like we get $8,526 because if you remember, we were a 20J district at one time and there's some restrictions on a whole harmless districts on how much increase they can have. So a year ago, I was sitting here telling you the government's going to make up the difference. And to get us the minimum increase last year, they had to add in $5. Well, typically they roll that in, so that becomes your foundation loss. Well, depending on which of those numbers they work with, even if we took the governor's, 120 could be 115, depending on which number they start from. And I've seen it both ways. You would say, well, just look at the charts. And I have. Both <laughs> charts are different. So it depends if you're looking at the Senate's version of what they think is going to happen or the House. Now, one thing that's in her proposal is different. I don't know if you'll see this in any other one. She added a Section 28. And she's weighting allocations per pupil. And she's bringing in an increase in special ed, about 4% over what everybody currently gets, by doing $60 a student. Um, the at risk, which is the uh, 31A money that you've seen, she's talked about making that all on a per student basis here and taking it out of the 31A category and put it here, which would be about $79 a student. I guess the best I could tell you, the other thing that she's looking at is 50%. Um, if you remember, um, if you're a true 31A district, you qualify, you <clears> get <throat> so much money, we would get, because we're a hold harmless district, we got 30% of that. Much better than nothing, so that was a great step forward. She's proposed that we would get 50% uh, of that allocation, and that alone would give us the increased amount. Now, it's based on your at-risk population and things like that, um, but that's a possibility. The way we count student membership, the FTE is staying basically the same. It's 10%, uh, I should change the numbers here, from 19 and 19. Um, it's always been that way. The October count is the heavier time. 
Um, we've been able to count students in between count days. Uh, that doesn't amount to a whole bunch of people. Everyone kind of got wise to that. It was a really good thing the first year they had it because not everybody kept track. But between the count days, if you add students, you can claim those, and, and we continue to do so. It doesn't amount to very much anymore because everybody claims them the other way now, but um, it does allow you to claim some. Uh, the 31A is being rolled into the weighted allocation that you see up above. There is still that $25 per high school student that we've been getting. Um, interesting one here is the Great Start Readiness Program funding. Um, as you see, it's uh, currently $7,250. She's proposing to take it to $8,500. So that would be a, a change. Uh, I think Mike, you had said before that this had not changed since its initiation so, when it came. So. so for eight years, it's been that dollar amount, and her rationale was it was time to move that up. They've increased right. GSRP <clears throat> spending to put more students in, but not the amount per student. Right. Um, the Section 147 money is all about the MIPSERS, which is the uh, State Employee Retirement System. And so if you remember, they have a maximum contribution. Um, this pretty much will be a given in anybody's proposal, would my guess. You'll see it's creeping up just a little bit on the top end, that the maximum for the employee to, to put in from 27.16 to 27.5, so about 0.4 uh, increase on our end on some retirement costs. Um, they are going to keep the cost offset there, the uh, 147A, and again, these are the kind of categoricals if they ever did away with them, would be a direct increased cost to the district in a hurry. And put so, you in the high 30s, yeah. and I'm not that old, but when I started as a superintendent, it was 9%, so you can see how much retirement has increased over that time. So when you mm -hmm. see our maximum contributions, if you go down here to the difference, to the uncapped <clears> rates, <throat> they're, they're filling the gap in. That's what the 147C does. It puts a rate cap on what we have to do. And even there, you'll see that some of their numbers are going up a little bit on both ends, too. So that, you know, again, that leaves us a little more to fill in, if you will, as we work. But they've done a nice job there, and we wouldn't want to see that money go away. Can you scroll up for a second, yep. Bob? You said you had a <clears throat> small additional allocation from the governor, but you didn't say the CTE. Yeah, the CTE is not as clear as to if that, uh, it should be an increase in actual dollars we get. But it's not clear. It's it's going to be one of the 61 funds that might go away. So it's it's uh, if I had more details and could figure that out, I'd let you know. But I think it's 61D where the monarchy remove that and make it all go in this uh, plus 47 dollars a student. Um, Appears to be that she's taking it out of a grant and putting in like a the foundation. There's, for there's it. some but it's, increase it's a, a to it. There is some dollar increase, but it's not as much as oh, you're going to get forty-seven dollars extra because she's going to take it out of another fund. That's very much like the at risk. I should be careful on that one too because we do already get thirty-one A money. That seventy-nine dollars is not like a seventy-dollar increase. That's just that would be what it would take to make up the new pot of money. We, if it if this goes, we'll see more. Um, the House and the Senate have both talked about uh, April 20th sometime in there, maybe having a proposal out there. And when you finally get those two or all three, uh, you really do get a pretty good picture of, you know, where they're headed. Um, I think there's two big issues with this one. I think Mike would concur with this one. Uh, there's no question to do what the governor's proposed, uh, the road tax. And this is directly tied to the 45 cents. If that doesn't happen, this budget's off the table. And there was a little bit of roadblock for everybody from what we've been reading on the, uh, the retirees tax, which they're, they're taxing retirees, but at one time they didn't. She would like to remove that. And from the people that we know and that respond back from the, the political scene in Lansing are saying those are more like the two biggest stumbling blocks. There's some things I think everybody would agree with down there, and there'll be others that we struggle. And it's, it's the first time they're not all from the same party, so it's going to be a little harder for them to work it out. Hers, hers is far enough away from some traditional ways of funding that that's sometimes a little harder to get moving. Um, but we'll see. And we'll know a lot better when they come in. If I can take you to the very bottom, just so you can see, uh, you're talking like a 120 increase, so that'd be two years in a row. And the funds are kind of important. The minimum anybody would get under the governor's proposal is $8,051 as opposed to 7871 currently. And what they call the basic foundation grant is 8529 And like I said, it's a 1.5. If you notice the 8529 and what we would get 8651 while we're still ahead of that, you know, that constantly with that 2x formula, you know, grows on us. So it's, 
it's just what it is. Um, I don't want to trade. We're glad where we are, but um, one time know. we were seven or eight hundred dollars above yeah. that amount. So you can see we've had mm -hmm. to learn to grow the other way. So again, as we know more, and you'll follow along in the paper with us, we'll be able to put in some kind of an estimate. Like if they went back to a true, let's say two X formula, to give you that example. So let's say the top's the same, and they want to give the one eighty. We'd be more likely to get ninety. If there's something in between, or they want to use some money one place to another. If they don't have the full funds because of the um, tax, the gas tax now going through, um, then it would uh, throws everybody else off because she's moved money that they would normally take out for colleges out of this. And so, you know, where we'd be, there might not be the increases in some of those other areas. It looks like she wants to start focusing more on with the, the weighted category and uh, go away from the per pupil foundation allowance and, and have it more she, specific for the student, depending on the student's need. So like you're at risk, your CTE, your yeah, high school. The study your, that showed um, how schools should be funded and where they haven't been funded, um, that is what she's trying to follow to a certain extent. And so she's trying to move the legislature towards that. The House and Senate, it sounds like they're going to come out with a budget that's almost identical or even shared budget. For the first time, they've always, we've always had three. Mm -hmm. And so, as Bob said, I think once those two come out, what we're hearing next week um, is that we'll have an idea where it'll land, which is probably somewhere in between. So. Right. Um, I'm going to jump ahead then. Hang on here. <clears throat> and I want to show you a couple of things because I think it's important for you as a board to think about this. but. Something that we shared with all our employee groups when we talked to them this year, um, especially in the negotiations, is why do we have the fund balance that we currently have? I mean, how did we get to the point where we've been able to put money away? <clears throat> and so I did a couple of things. I'm going to throw this real quickly for you, but just so you can kind of take a look at it. We have had student enrollment stability, and it's made a big difference. Uh, we've had improved state funding. Uh, we've had bond savings, our number of new teachers in the last three years. Um, our recent budgets, we don't get to do that very often, where the revenue exceeds the expenditures. Um, that is not very often. Our variance each year has been good. We're not spending everything we budget, and we've had a lot of increased grants. What I was going to show you was I tried to capture different things in a chart, and I don't want to take all the time to go through, but <clears throat> I've got the years from 2007 8 all the way to 1819 here. And if I just start with when we talked about student room at first, let me drop over to this chart. You know, here we are back in 07, 08, we had 9,196 students. And as you can see, we were on a roll for a while of 233, 250, 243, 254, uh, negative 119, and then minus 309, which I think is when Mike came and shocked us all because that was way over what we had, we had budgeted for. So that's the last time. So when I say that, I guess one of the reasons we showed this to everybody is to show you historically how fast things can change, too. So it's not like the student enrollment's been stabilizing forever. I want people always to realize that. And even if you look over these five years, uh, we have had a minus 53 in there. Then there's just a, a four up. Then there's a minus 47. A lot of things tied to birth rates. Um, it's not like more people are moving in. It's uh, somewhat we're either dependent on the birth rate or I guess bringing them in from another school system of some kind, whether that's all the way from homeschool to another one of the schools surrounding us, public or parochial. So that's what's changed. If we would have been going, the, the in 2013, excuse me, 12-13 projection showed we should have been at 72.87. And so we're at 76.87 right now. So uh, that's one thing that really turned a frown from when we got started. If you want to look at state funding, and I tried to highlight this. In 8-9, we were getting $8,904 a student. And you'll see even today we're at 8531 So we're not bringing in the same per student as we did in 2008, 2009, basically 10 years ago. And I tried to show you how it changed. We, we had a couple of nice years in here. These were years where you see the real negatives where the state dropped a lot. Uh, era funds were in there. If you remember edgy jobs and era funds, that goes back a ways, but the, that's when the federal government stepped in, and otherwise these would have all looked pretty even leaner than they were. But you'll see we went through a, a period, even as is in the 13, 14, where our nets, you know, $30, yep, it looked like it went up 50, but when you take away the categoricals, we went down four. We only mm -hmm. made 25 when it was 70. These have really been the positive years. So we're still $373 per student away from that high point. 
in 8.9. And if you take the um, 85.31, the closest I could find to today's funding was back in 05.06. So just to give you an idea, heading in the right direction, but that's one of the reasons we had a little bit bigger fund balance. Um, the uh, bond savings, I don't need to go on about that, but you know, a lot of the computer lease versus purchase, hardware one-to-one, -one, controlling some of our energy costs, I mean, even to the point of being able to add air conditioning and not have increased energy costs. Um, the bus purchases and, of course, the capital improvement for all the different projects, as you know, the bond will not take care of everything. And as the structures get older, we're finding lots of things to spend our capital funds on. Mm -hmm. um, the new teaching staff, 129 new teachers in the last three years. That's 28% of our staffs turned over in that time, so that's one of the reasons we've got money there. And then um, the other part I wanted to show you is up here, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about it so I can show you going forward. Um, if you go back to these years in, in this kind of red pinkish color here, um, these are the actual budgets that the board approved. So this was the revenue you thought you were going to have, and this is the expenditures. So you really adopted a budget when the year started um, where there was going to be a deficit, and the board knew that, of $2.1 million. Turns out in 7-8 that ended up being $3.6 million. So when people always think it comes in better than we think, there's always a few cases, and those few make you kind of stop for a minute. That's why we try to be real conservative when we budget. But you'll see you had years where you had to adopt a deficit budget. Here's $2 million one, and you only had 14000 that you ended up in deficit. You had years where you thought it was going to be deficit, and it turned out to be positive. And that can happen like when air dollars come in and different things happen along the way. So the reason I show that to you is the only real greens where it came in were in this last few years where we've been able to put a more money away even than we thought we were going to put away. So it's good that we had the money for all those lean times back up there. Um, you really wouldn't want to think about it because if we would have actually turned out the way we thought we originally were going to budget it, we would have been some $24 million. You would not have had a fund balance to, to last that. And in fact, it's turned out to be about $3 million that you've had to uh, dip in or come out. So I guess there's a couple things I want you to think about when we finally bring the budget back to you. Uh, you know this will happen, and that's why you have a fund balance. Um, we will not, as the costs go up, and you will have employee costs going up just with th them getting older, we will get to points where one of two things is going to happen. You might have to adopt a budget that's deficit in the sense of your expenditures are going to be higher than your revenue. One of two things will happen. There are lots of years where the variance staff very well that we don't expect you to spend every penny you have. It's there if we need it, but if you don't spend everything in the budget, there's nothing wrong with that. So you will start out with a deficit, but you'll bring in enough revenue with the variance that it'll come out to be a positive. By the same token, I think there are going to be budgets that you're going to go in you're going to have a fund balance built up for lots of things. It's to weather the bad times, but it's also to purposely go in and say, we're going to spend some money. We know we're going to. We're taking it out of fund balance because we want to fund this at this time. I think I would argue with you that you should be careful when you do that because you always have to think about the sustaining cost going down the road on it. So you might reach in for one-time purposes because that makes sense. You might reach in sometimes saying, I know we're going to have to sustain this, and maybe that will come through the growth of the, the formula of us being funded or our students staying. So I just wanted to prep you that those are the two things that I can foresee. It's, it's very tough in this day and age to, to always have the, and, and again, you're not a bank. You're not trying to put money away. Uh, you're trying to get enough money in your fund balance. I do think there's a bottom number you want to be careful with. You know, you, you know, that 15% would be nice to not to go below that like we did at one time. But I think you need to do the weather, the, the, uh, the bad times. But I also think there are times that you're going to go into that savings account, if you said, because you're going to know as a board we'd like to spend some money on. And I don't know what that is at this point, but I just want you to think that way, um, that you're not going to forever get that. And that's a tough move unless you've been on the board before. And you can see we had boards that if you were on the right years, you started by adopting deficit budgets for a long time there. And so I just see that as important. Let me give you a quick financial picture here. Um, just so you can kind of see how this works. And we play around with this, but if uh, there's two things that affect the revenue changes. There's the student enrollment and the increase in the foundation allowance. So, and the consultant estimates aren't in. I've already contacted him. I'm talking to him Thursday. And I'll have a better idea. But let's say we lose 50 students. You can see right there how much money that's out of your funds just from losing that per pupil funding. Let's say it goes up $90, again, conservative. 
You balance those two off, you're going to bring in another 250000 in revenue. You have expenditures. And this is not to say that you shouldn't have these, but again, if your steps aren't frozen for employees and they're gaining experience, you're going to pay for employee steps. That's just a natural uh, cost to doing business. In this district, with the number of people we have, that's somewhere around 675000 a year. Okay, so that's just important to note that. Salary increases. For every 1%, if everybody in the district got 1%, That'd be somewhere around five hundred and ninety-three thousand dollars. So when we've been looking at a two percent, this includes FICA and retirement too. It's important. I'm giving you the full number, not just because any more FICA and retirement can add up to fifty percent onto it. So I'm showing you um, all of that. So since most of our salary increases, as you know, and you've seen some of the packages we brought to you, somewhere depending on. Um, what group it was, 2 to 3%, it's all been in that range. So when I use a 2%, you can see that would be what I would anticipate increase in salary, FICA, and retirement. Um, lane changes, I only show you that for teachers. That's one of the few places they have lane changes, but as they get more degrees, a lane is like bachelor's, master's, master's plus 30. And they move across uh, as they gain more. And so, um, especially with young teachers, it appears it's a little higher than it's been, but Again, they're starting way out here, so you got a lot in bachelors. They're going to work their way across, and that's a, a raising money. A medical cost-wise, remember the program we're currently on, it runs uh, January to December, so we know for the first half what it will cost, but the other two-thirds of it we don't. So we're estimating a 5% increase. Um, that would get us through that half. It could be more than that, but we've been pretty lucky lately with the cost we've seen. That would be just shy of 200000 we have our vision, dental, life insurance, et cetera, et cetera. There's about another 58000 Always a question mark on additional personnel because it just depends. Uh, and that's one of the things we look at seriously as we build this budget the rest of the way through is how, how would we like to spend that money? Boy, there's a lot of positions people would like, but what can we add? What can't we add? How much can we afford? And, and you have to watch that part, too. <clears throat> uh, the balance our budgets. Um, I put an estimate 150000 in there because no matter what we do, when the buildings and everybody come to us, there's some cost that they can't stop either. So as much as we've tried to hold them uh, very much flat, um, there's going to be costs that they can't change. I can't change the cost of the diesel fuel or whatever, um, utilities. I can't. There are some costs that are fees that it is the fee we have. It's the software license we need. So that may be a little bit low. But just as a rough example, that, that would be a total of an increase of expenditures of 2.4. If you take off that part that was revenues, that's 2.1. If I get a variance of 1%, again, very conservative, it would bring us to a deficit budget that you'd adopt of about 1.3. Now, that's all guesswork at this point. I wouldn't want you to think otherwise. I don't lose food. I don't. If the district doesn't lose 50 students, that moves. If you get 120 instead of 90, that moves. If we get 2% variation or 3, that moves. All of those things move. It's same token. I already told you, I think the 150 is a little light from what I've seen. So, and the person, personnel, we haven't added anything right. there. We haven't added anyone in. But that's where, if I look at on the surface, and I'm not sure, and then this is when the details come in, and it's why from here to uh, the June meeting, or actually the FFO meeting in June, is kind of a race for myself and the business department to figure out where is that going to come at, in at. And we will be conservative, but I can see, and you could always see this coming, that we've been uh, lucky enough to put some money in that fund balance. We've done a really good job. Uh, we're going to be purposeful on, on anything we'd ask you to do out of that. But uh, the, the, again, with the kind of variances that we got, if we didn't have variance in the district, you know, and again, if that doesn't hold true, then that's when you as a board sit there and say, we're not seeing the variance anymore. Can't do that. But I think you just need to be prepared. And again, I think there's two reasons. You're going to do a deficit and the variance is going to come through and, and cover all that. And there's other times that, you know, you as a, as a board have decided this is a sound use of money and we should do this and bring that fund balance down a little bit. So that's where I would leave you at and tell you that's what we've looked at. Um, like I said, that, that June 10th date, uh, of course, we'll talk to FFO before that, but that gives you a good indication of where we're at right now. Great. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions or for Bob? What's your projected date of the consultant estimates? Um, he will call, when we have the calls, he always comes back with he's done a lot of legwork. 
and then they develop a formula for where he's got three categories, low, high, and most likely. So in that conversation, he'll sit there and talk to you about what do you know about the community? Have you seen this? This is what I saw. Um, those, those kinds of things. And then he takes birth rates to start with. Yep. He follows our last trends, and then if we see any movement one way or another. He'll do housing starts. He's, he's got a ton of things that he looks at, but then, of course, you know, sometimes we're defying that. In other words, you haven't had the housing starts. You should be, you know, X here. And so that's when he comes in then, and the, after the conversation usually takes about a week. He'll take those and he'll send you back how he would suggest the formula. So he'd say, here's where I think most likely you're going to end up. Here would be the low and the high. And if you're doing it for, and he'll ask you, what are you using this for? If it's budget purposes, he'll say, um, you know, take the most likely, multiply it by two, and add on one high. And he gives you a little formula based on what you gave him for information. So that's typically how it works. And he's usually in the range. It's just do we pick the same spot with that formula in there. And uh, we've kind of defied him a little bit the last last year. Three or four years. Yeah. We've done better. So, so that's why that, it's about that's a week or two's time. From, from here, yeah. Okay. So one one other question, Bob. As we continue <clears throat> to spend capital funds out of the bond to make energy improvements and talk about tearing down another building, those are going to have utility upsides for our budget. But are those all offset by AC ads, or can you project any of those yet? I, think, I guess what I would tell you what we've noticed so far is it's offset the AC and any price increases in the utility the actual cost of okay. the utility. We've Fair not enough. seen, that's a savings, but right. I'm going to say if you're looking for AC and square footage, because we've mm -hmm. right. square footage. It's yeah. absolutely true. My, I forgot the part, that's Mike's right. absolutely right. 10,000 square feet of where we're adding to each of the elementaries. Um, yeah. it's, it's, okay. so, so that's what we've seen so far. All right, great. Uh, school district budgeting is uh, very difficult, and I'm glad you put this all together for us and uh, walked us through this workshop, and we look forward to uh, learning more as the state and federal, uh, the state comes back with uh, their proposal for the budget as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you. You have to close the meeting, and we have to reopen. Right. I'd accept a motion to adjourn this meeting. I move we adjourn this meeting. Second. Moved by Ms. Friedel, seconded by Mr. Rausch. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. And this meeting is adjourned. That was the budget meeting. Now we are moving into our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. And uh, we had already done our Pledge of Allegiance tonight, but we'll roll right into our roll call once again. So, Scott, could you do a roll call? Can. President Singer. Here. Secretary Baker. Treasurer Friedel. Here. Member Blasey. Here. Member Lauterbach. Member Rush. Here. Great. Thank you. All right. Moving into our consent agenda. Uh, we have several items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone who would like to remove any of the agenda items for uh, discussion? Okay, we have item 6.1, which is approval of the meeting minutes for March 18th. Item 6.2, which is staff members' resignation. Item 6.3 is approval of the payment of the school system's budget. And item 6.4 are legal invoices for payment. Uh, if there is no objection, these items will be adopted. Uh, at this yeah, at this time, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda items 6.1 through 6.4 as identified on the agenda tonight. Support. Moved by McFarland, support by Friedel. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. And the consent agenda passes. We'll move into item 7, which is Board of Education Matters, presentations to the board. Uh, Mr. Sherrill. We have two shining stars again this month, and our first one is Joanna Hewitt. Joanna will come up and join me. And right here, Joanna, for a minute while I read a little bit about you, if you don't mind. <laughs> Ms. Hewitt joined FPS team in 2015 as a paraprofessional at H.H. Dow High School. She assists and supports special education students as well as with the Charger Band program. Joanna arranges her schedule so she can be present in the evening and weekends when the Charger Band is practicing or performing. Ms. Hewitt was nominated for a Shining Star by an NPS parent who is also a colleague from an education partner organization. 
Among her comments were the following. Joanne is a highly effective paraeducator who is kind and patient with students who have unique learning situations in the classroom. She is an excellent communicator and I am very, very appreciative of her efforts to confirm important information that I may need concerning after school events. She is always present for band functions that are required to report in the evenings or weekends. It is comforting to know that my child has someone so responsible assisting him so he can participate fully with his peers. She is a valuable asset to Midland Public Schools and HHL High School. Congratulations, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. Our second shining star today is Michael Fair. If Michael would come up and join me. I saw him somewhere. There he is. And I'll read a little bit about Michael again, make him uncomfortable for a minute. So, <laughs> Mr. Fair joined the MPS team this school year as a second grade teacher at Center Park Elementary School. He graduated from Michigan State University in 2017 with a bachelor's degree in elementary education, majoring in language arts, and minoring in teaching English to students of other languages. He completed a fourth grade year-long intern internship in East Lansing in 2018. Among the comments he received from his intern supervisors were the following. Michael is hardworking, enthusiastic, energetic, and while at the same time building good relationships with students and family. He goes above and beyond an assignment as a natural when it comes to ethics and relationships. Mr. Fair spent six months, six months as a bilingual teacher in Spain in 2016 teaching English to adults as well as children from 3 to 18 years of age. Mr. Fair was nominated by, for the Shining Star by MPS Parent. Among her comments were the following. Mr. Fair gives each of the students an opportunity to take ownership of their classroom each day. This gives them the ability to help with their public speaking and leadership within themselves. He has a passion for what he does and it is passed on to his students. He is a superhero to a lot of students mm -hmm. and a true shining star. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you. And our next presentation is on Prodigy, and we'll tell you just what that means in a minute. That is an acronym Mr. Brutin, I think, created. And I think, Tracy, are you introducing everybody? Who's introducing here? Uh, good evening, my name is Kirk Gledhill. I am an uh, art teacher at uh, Herbert Henry Dow High School and for tonight the commercial art and production uh, instructor. Um, commercial art and production program began back in uh, 1989 under Ms. Carol Lewin. Um, it has since that time continued to be a course which prepares the students um, at a professional level for graphic design. They learn um, on the programs that are the professional level programs, the same programs that professional graphic designers are using in the field. Um, they produce calendars, they um, produce logos, um, some logos for outside of our school system. Tonight you're going to hear about one that's within the school system. Um, we produce and design uh, prom tickets and, and homecoming tickets and brochures and flyers for all different programs both within our school and within the district and beyond. Um, we've, we've redone even the uh, overall look and uh, graphic presentation of um, a number of businesses within Midland that approach Our MPS us. logo. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That was done <laughs> here too, yeah. Um, Sarah Pisarchek is a uh, senior here at, at Dow High and um, is uh, going to be attending uh, the Stamps School of Art at the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor in the fall. Um, she's going to pre be pursuing an industrial design degree, which she's going to couple with an LSA degree. And um, uh, it's been designing for us now for two years. She's in the program for her second year, uh, works very independently, does a lot of freelance type work. And when this particular assignment came in, she was the perfect fit for it. And she's going to talk a little bit about her design process and then this logo specifically. Please welcome Sarah Sarchik. Thank you, Mr. Gladhill. Um, so, like Mr. Gladhill said, I'm Sarah Pazarczyk, and when I was uh, given this assignment, I was really excited about it for what Prodigy stands for. And I had a lot of initial ideas, but basically what I decided on and what you see on the logos on the kids' t-shirts today 
is I wanted to create something that all of the kids and educators involved could look at and see themselves in. So I tend to have a very hand-drawn and loose kind of style to my designs. So what I did was I took a Sharpie and I started doodling some things that kind of represented what Midland Public Schools really fosters in our the education that they provide here in Midland and then I put that into Photoshop and I edited those so that they were clean and digital and then I put that into Adobe Illustrator which is one of the programs Mr. Gladhoe was talking about and then I played around with size and composition and kind of going back to the educators and the kids of the program I wanted the logo to be made up of the elements that really are representative of what Prodigy is. So all of the little doodles of like science and math and the arts and lots of other things make up the word Prodigy. So um, it would just be a word if it wasn't for the children involved and the educators involved. So I really wanted to represent that in my design. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Tracy Renfro and I'm the proud principal of Chestnut Hill. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and also thank the parents who made arrangements for all of the kids to be here. And they're all uh, showcasing Sarah's artwork tonight. The shirts look great. Um, the kids love them. We're very proud of them. I'm here with Elizabeth Owen. She's a fifth grade teacher at Chestnut Hill and she also teaches our prodigy two times a week, 8 to 8.30. And these kids come early every morning, and they've learned a lot, and they're here to share their experience with you. Hi, as Tracy said, I'm Elizabeth Owens, and I teach Prodigy at Chestnut Hill. As part of the Midland Public Schools Gifted and Talented Reform, Central Park, Plymouth, and Chestnut Hill have launched a pilot program called Prodigy. Prodigy is an acronym for promoting rigorous opportunities to develop innovative and gifted youth. This program includes students from grades three to five and we meet twice a week before school. All schools mentioned above have been working through an exploratory curriculum this year to identify what works and what doesn't. It's been a learning curve for all of us, but we've had some fun along the way. I'll now be turning it over to the students who will share a little bit about their experience this year. Hello, I am Gabby and I am a fifth grade student in the Prodigy program. I have learned so much in Prodigy this school year, I wish I had time to share all of it. Prodigy is a good program to extend my thinking and to have fun while learning. My favorite activity was when we built rockets because I love learning about all the different forces that were pushing against the balloon that I didn't even know about before such as thrust, gravity, and wind resistance. I learned about engineering and why cars are shaped the way they are and tried to use what I learned about cars to engineer our rockets. I learned that so that and so much more in Prodigy this year. It did not just extend my learning or my way of thinking, it changed my perspective on learning. The next person up is Danny. My name is Danny Ferrison and I'm in fourth grade at Chestnut Hill. I have learned so much in Prodigy and I learned a lot from the other people in my class too. Here's just one of the things that we learned this year. I learned a lot about different cultures during a program called Out of Eden. Out of Eden is a group designed by Harvard that teaches kids about slow journalism. The journalist who leads it, Paul, taught me about the path of human migration. It was fun learning about other cultures. Next up is Jensen. Hi, my name is Jensen. I'm a fifth grader at Chestnut Hill. This year in Prodigy, I learned a lot about teamwork. When we work together to get things done, we end up finishing it right. My favorite activity is when we made boats on water and saw how much weight they could hold. I like this activity because we got to see how different designs work better than others. I learned that you had to have a lot of surface area because the more you have, the less dense the boat is and then it won't sink. This might help me later in life because if there's ever a problem, I will know how to handle it. <laughs> this is why I love Prodigy. Next up, speaking is Landon. Hello, my name is Landon and I'm a third grader in the Prodigy program. We learned a lot this year. First, we learned about math with Joe Bowler, who is a professor at Stanford University. 
who watched short videos about math and talked about how speed does not matter, and you only learn math by deep thinking and trying your hardest. After that, we did Out of Eden. We learned about Paul, who is a journalist, and who went on a journey and visited landmarks. Lastly, we are working on science activities, which have been my favorite so far. Next person up is Kelly. Hello, my name is Kelton and I am a third grader and during Prodigy I have learned a lot about long division because it was a good review and helped me to remember how to do it. My favorite science activity was the parachute engineering contest because I want to do some skydiving before I get too old and I really <laughs> like making things like parachutes. What I learned about the parachutes was about how different forces interact like gravity, wind resistance, and drag. Up next is Lainey who will talk about her time at Prodigy. Hello, my name is Lainey and I'm a fourth grader in Pro Prodigy. So far in Prodigy, we have learned a lot of math and science. In math, we learned about long division that helped me a lot in my classroom. When we learned about science, one thing we learned about is surface tension. Surface tension is the bond of water molecules on the surface of liquid. When you break the surface tension, whatever is on top of the liquid, if it is more dense than the water, will sink or go to the sides. My favorite activity was learning about surface tension because it helped me learn new things that could help me later in life. Next, you will listen to Kira, who will, t who will be talking about her experience. Hi, my name is Kira, and I am a fifth grade student in the Prodigy program. I have learned so much in Prodigy, and it is so fun. I have challenges in Prodigy, and I find ways to complete them. I feel a lot smarter with these challenges. My favorite activity in Prodigy was making the balloon rockets. I learned about wind resistance and how sports car were pushed right through the wind because the, wind, because the design of a sports car makes the wind go around the car. After I learned that, my partner and I tried to make our balloon rocket look like that, so we taped a cup on the front of our balloon rocket to, to try to decrease the wind resistance. Because of that change in our design, our balloon rocket made it to the end of the string, and it was the fastest in the class. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot in this activity, and that is why I liked it so much. Now I would like to introduce Katie. Hello, my name is Katie. I am a fourth grader in Prodigy. Before, I had very good teachers who, that have challenged me to do my best. After this year, I feel smarter than I was before. During Prodigy, I have learned a lot. In math, I learned about like how to do averages and how to do a lot more with division. We did a lot with engineering and building. My favorite science activity was building ships with tinfoil. We did that because we were learning about surface tension. The funny thing about that activity was my ship broke millions of times. I had to construct three new models. Another program we did was called Out of Eden. It was cool. A journalist from National Geographic named Paul helped traveled in our ancestors' past. It was awesome. All these activities are why Prodigy is so much fun. Next up is Braylon. Hi, my name is Braylon, and I'm a fifth grade student who has learned a lot from this program, ranging from the order of operations to what it takes to keep a parachute up in the air the longest. My favorite activity was a math activity called four fours. It was challenging trying to use only operations and fours and having to use four of them to get a certain number. I learned how to use the order of operations and how to use exponents as well as parentheses. My favorite part of pro Prodigy is going back to class and having experience with subjects that helped me in my classroom. On behalf of all of us in the Prodigy program, we would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and share our experience with you. Thank you. They're ready for any questions you may have. That would be great. Thank okay. you. We'll open it up to any questions. I'm just, I don't really have a question, but I'm just really amazed at what great speakers you guys are. Um, you must have practiced a lot speaking, <laughs> did you? It was a good job. I was impressed. All what right. Do, what does the back of your shirt say? We can't see the back. Oh, I can't read it. <laughs> Education. Hey, Gabby, is the most powerful weapon which you yes. can use to change the world. By right. Nelson Mandela. Nice. 
Well, I'm glad we have so many students who are taking advantage of this wonderful uh, pilot program and getting up a little earlier a couple times a week. And it sounds like you are getting right to work and, and exploring and getting involved in a lot of real neat hands-on activities. So thank you for coming and sharing your experience with us and keep up the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move into item 7.3 for information. We have our 2019 STAR volunteers. So as you know, we are so fortunate to have so many volunteers in Midland Public Schools that we actually need a volunteer to organize all of them. And so we are very fortunate to have our United for Success program volunteer who does that as well. And so April is uh, Volunteer Appreciation Month. And so we have a number of volunteers that we're going to honor tonight, one from, uh, well, two from one building, I think. And if Cindy will teach me how to use this clicker, we might move through these slides. <laughs> Click through, Dave, over there. Is that easier? Just click, just click. So at the end of February, um, and still counting, we had 3,662 approved volunteers in our NIH for Success program and 16,450 hours. So it's pretty impressive just right there in February. So it got so large a few years ago, we partnered with United Way, and we created a uh, coordinator for that program to go through. And we started in 15 recognizing our volunteers. It was a just suggestion from um, our staff, and so we are doing so tonight. And at Adams, we have Mrs. Candace Bayless, who has been a volunteer at Adams Elementary for five years. She volunteers in the Adam, Adams Media Center at least three times a week. And was also trained in Dibbles in order to help keep the library open during Dibbles testing period. And that's quite a feat because if you've been through our Dibbles process, I know Mary I think has helped before and Lynn has, it takes a lot of uh, effort and a lot of time off our teachers' hands. Center Park, we have Miss Lisa Haney, who has been a dedicated volunteer in the Center Park lunchroom for two years at East Lawn before that. Mrs. Haney volunteers a couple times a week. She helps 720 Center Park explorers pass through the lunch periods. Lisa is always caring and helpful to all of our students. Chestnut Hill, you may recognize Mr. Shaheen, walked into Chestnut Hill about three years ago and said, I'm here to help. He reads with students, assists with Chromebooks and Google Classroom, helps with PYP activities and reflections, works with the project lead the way design projects, and much more. Fantastic job by Rick. Plymouth, we have Miss Sally Yan, I hope I'm saying her last name right, is very, very active in the Plymouth PTO. I did not, I see them shaking their head at me. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, thank you. She also volunteers during recess in the classroom. This year, Sally wrote a grant for the fourth grade to secure field trip funding to the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. When asked how, how to help, Sally doesn't even hesitate. Siebert, we have Jamie and Scott Ross have been regular Siebert volunteers in the classroom on school field trips at various events for the year. The Ross family supports Siebert with more than their time. They enrich classes by sharing their science knowledge and doing junior achievement and much, much more. Woodcrest, we have Miss Becky Duff has volunteered at Woodcrest for the past three years. She volunteers three days a week in the Woodcrest Library, in her children's classroom, and many other ways. Becky is very generous with her time, and students and staff enjoy her working with her. Jefferson, we have Miss January Prisby, started volunteering at Jefferson in the main office. During the school year, during this school year, Jefferson needed an immediate extra hand in the CI classroom and in the lunchroom. January jumped in with both feet, a teacher commented. She, was, she has a calming personality with the students and generally cares for each one. She has been a tremendous asset to our program. I'm sure that's a big benefit in the CI program. Northeast, Mr. Larry Adamick has volunteered at MPS for over 25 years. 
first at Carpenter, then at Central, and now at Northeast. Larry tutors students in math, but is more than a tutor. He brings in fun mind games for the students and wears different hats, so he can share with students the many places he has visited. They look forward to his help every week. Larry truly cares about the students. And Midland High couldn't choose just one, so we have two. It's <laughs> Karen Fridstum. Fitzstrom has been a volunteer for several years and is active in the building a couple times a week as a band mom, uniform inventory controller, and many other ways. Karen always has a smile on her face. Many times she is here before school and after school during lunch. She has a great rapport with students, staff, and parents. And the second one is Miss Lori Witt, who has been an MPA, MMA, Midland High volunteer for six years. A few years ago, she helped start the campus cleanup project where students partner with parents to help beautify the M Midland High grounds in both spring and fall. Lori serves as a member of the Veterans Day Committee and Midland High's new parent partners organization. She has a heart for service and is the first to roll up her sleeves and get the job done. And finally, we have Dow High, Miss Anne's Ainsley Donhauer. How did I do on that Down one, guys? Yeah. Down Hour, thank you. Has been a volunteer at Dow High for about five years. She produces Dow High's monthly HH Dow Parent IB News. If you've seen that, that's new this year, um, which is trip monthly at all Dow High and Jefferson Middle School parents. Ansley is a gifted writer, an experienced educator, and she's a perfect liaison for the communication between the parents and the school. So once again, thank you to our many volunteers and the amazing amount of hours they put in. 3,600 amazing volunteers so far this February, as of February. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. We have such great uh, involvement and volunteers. <clears throat> Okay, we'll move into item 7.4, which is for action, it is a ratification of resolution 2019 bond issue. And I would uh, be open to accept a motion for this action item. I will move to, sorry. I will move to approve the bond ratification resolution for the issuance and sale of the 2019 school building and site bond series two, a complete resolution uh, shall be attached to the original of these meeting minutes. Support. Moved by Roush, support by Fredell, and we'll open it up for any comments or conversation. <clears throat> Just a few pieces on that for you, Pam. We'll talk about it later, but we did very, very well that day on sale, saved our taxpayers a lot of money because we hit the market at about the perfect time, they told us. Um, and so um, we saved significant dollars over that time. This action you've done once before on Bond Series uh, 1, and you'll be back again in a few years for Bond Series 3, doing the same. Yeah, it was great news to uh, get such uh, a great rating going into that, and then uh, just hit it at the right time. So uh, it's good news for, for Midland Public Schools, for sure, and for our community. All right, if there's no more discussion or question, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of approving item 7.4, ratification of resolution, the 2019 bond issue, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 7.5, which is for action. We have the furniture purchase for Adams Elementary. Mr. Cooper? Yeah, this is... Uh a little bit like a broken record, but this is the last of the elementary cafeterias. Uh, very similar design in each of the buildings. Uh, actually very similar cost to each building that we've gotten. Um, this one's for Adams. It's for $22,864. Great Lakes uh, Furniture Supply at of Michigan. Again, purchased through the national contracts, which gives us the best <coughs> price possible. Um, after this one, we'll have the media center at Adams, and then We'll have most of the furniture purchase that, that we're going to be doing. Very good. Thank you. At this time, I'll be open to accept a motion for item 7.5. I move that we approve the issuance of a purchase order in the amount of $22,864 to Great Lakes Furniture Supply, Inc. of Holland, Michigan. Support. Okay. Motion by McFarland and support by Roush, and we'll open it up for discussion. We've done this so many times. I think we've asked all of our furniture questions. 
So very good. We'll uh, move into a vote then. All those in favor of approving item 7.5, Furniture Purchase for Adams Elementary, say aye. 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 All aye. opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 7.6, which is food service contract. Mr. Cooper? Yeah, as the, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture controls our food service contracts, they have to be rebid every five years, so this was due. So we did put out a bid um, for this year, um, for the next five years. Um, we have a winning bid in Chartwells, very typically in the food service areas. Um, it's pretty detailed what you can and can't do in the bid specifications. Has to be accepted by the state before I can even bring it back to you. So this is all gone through, and, and then and once you approve, I have to send it back to the state one more time. Um, while we had three companies come for the initial part, it's typical in the food service ones, especially um, when they see the size of our operations, unless they are active in the area, it's hard for them to come in and start up fresh. So it's not, uh, it's not atypical that you don't get multiple bids. They, they always want to know if you're happy with who you have. We try not to answer that question during the bidding process so we get the best bids possible. But Charwell's price is actually lower. Uh, you'll see it in there, 3.162. Uh, than it was uh, in the last year of the renewal of the last contract. And again, they have to meet all the specifications, so they can't just willy-nilly bid things out. Like I said, the state goes through all of those. So it's, it's with the, I'd say it's the most regimented bid process that we do is the food service contract. Okay, so this is for action, and we need to uh, vote on this, correct? Correct. Yep. All right, I'll uh, accept a motion for item 7.6 for the food service contract. I make the motion that we accept the food service contract uh, with Compass Group USA Incorporated by and through its Chartwells division. Support. Moved by Fredell, support by Rausch, and we'll open up for discussion. I was uh, amazed, as Bob was saying, of all the regulations that are stipulated ahead of time and uh, understanding why Chartwells was the one that came through. They were already had had the contract and were familiar with what uh, was going on here. So I'm glad to see that. And we've had a, a very good relationship with Chartwells over the years as well. All right, if there's no questions uh, or other comments, we'll move into a vote. All in favor of approving item 7.6, a food service agreement with Compass Groups USA, Inc., by and through its Chartwells division, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 7.7, .7, which is bus purchase. Mr. Cooper? Yeah, and the next two, actually, so I could say right now, are both um, putting in and having you approve, but being bought in the following fiscal year. If you don't do that with these items, uh, you won't have these. You have to, you have to close out way early and, and put your order in. So on the buses, um, very similar pattern of what we've been following, a couple buses. They're the 77 passenger bus, which if you remember, typically our school buses are 65 passengers, but we found the bus with the same wheelbase but extra capacity. Uh, we found that this is the nice one because it's been an issue, especially as we've added the uh, pre-primary center. This has built-in um, booster seats. If you have to go aftermarket, which we've done, um, it stops anybody from sitting behind them because of the way they're hooked down and for safety reasons. So you lose a lot of the capacity of your bus. And as we found earlier this year when they tried to take a field trip, um, that was a lot of trips with one or two buses that we had in, in stock that could do that because of the need for the booster seats with them. So this would be good purchase. The other thing you'll notice is we bought the under storage. We've done that once before with the 77 passenger buses. Uh, we thought at the time more for uh, the athletic teams, but it's turned out to be uh, something that people want, and it you know gives you a place to store things instead of using seats up there. So you do this through a process that puts it out there through MSBO and the state, and you put the specifications down for your bus, and there are three uh, bidders on there, and I think you saw the tab in there. And so we have the low bidder there, Mid Midwest Transit of Lansing, Michigan. The uh, unit price is $99,421. And the total price then is 198842 And those purchases will be made with bond funds. Very good. Thank you. And I'm open to accept a motion for item 7.7. .7. 
Make a motion to purchase the two buses from Midwest Transit uh, from the bond funds. Support. Motion by Roush, support by McFarland. We'll open it up for discussion. I think it's great to be able to get the larger bus and, and more uh, capability for, um, for the boosters as well as the undercarriage and um, uh, just better use of space all the way around. So when we need these buses anyway, it looks like the best, best solution. They make excellent trip buses when we send athletic teams with equipment as well. That allows more kids in there. So it's been a good, good route to go. We've had good experiences with them. So they we're um, doing very well on the bond purchases of buses. And so, so far our bus lease have, has gone well. And so um, we've, uh, it's hard to say this as a negative, I guess, but we're, we're pur purchasing negatively slower than we wanted to, what we originally built, which means our our purchase will last longer and you'll have new buses for a longer period of time. So, so far we've done very well. The buses in our fleet have held up well. The mechanics have done a great job. And so we're a bus or two behind, which means you'll purchase buses for a longer period of time. That makes sense if I'm explaining that well enough. Yeah, I'm, uh, I know our mechanics do a fabulous job over there. And now we've got the new uh, wash system so we can yep. keep, them, keep the salt off them and, and hopefully uh, keep them looking good for years and years. I'm sorry, Brad, did you have anything you want to add? Are we displacing two? Did yeah, there are, there are two buses I should have added that. Um, yeah. Both 2002s, um, roughly somewhere between 200 and 220,000 miles on. We go through an auction process on that. You don't get a lot, but um, we, we uh, some have been purchased more local than we usually yeah. do, but some of these things, buses, when they get to the end of their life, they go to Mexico and places like that. And what about... Will we, with our own forces, take our brand new radios out of those two, and we will install in the two new buses? Yep. Or do we do that through Anderson? Yeah, no, we we usually can transfer and install the radios yep. ourselves. That hasn't been a problem. And the same with the um, uh, the cameras. Once in a while, it's part of because you don't want to take the older yep. camera. It can be part of the order. I don't recall on these two if the new one has the camera on there. But once I think in a while, we're moving them over because they are new. Um, but. Brad, sometimes you do order them right with on them as well. You have the option. Depending on how old the bus and how old the, the cameras and radios yep. would be in those. Yeah. So I should be cautioning you on that. Yeah, the cameras in here. Yeah, that's sometimes, especially for the early buses, when we put cameras on them, um, quality not as good. So the reserves. More location. Probably right now our yep. reserves don't have cameras on them. And so you're, you'll see cameras at it until you have the full fleet of them on them. So the 2002s were, were reserve buses. They weren't running every day anymore. Okay. We don't reason. keep too many buses because, as you probably know, me in business, mm -hmm. um, even an idle vehicle costs you money, and so we we're pretty good about making sure we don't have access. The other point, Mike, that you made, I think, is a good point too, is that if you buy them all, if you buy a lot at one time, just like those two were two thousand twos, you also have that problem down the road of five or six of them all going at the same right. time. So it is good to stretch them out a little bit so that you're not turning over big parts of the fleet all at one time. So we try to spread it out to make sense that way, too. Very good. All right, if our questions are all answered, we'll uh, move into vote on item 7.7. .7. All those in favor of approving the uh, lowest bidder Midwest Transit of Lansing, Michigan at the unit price for each bus of $99,421 and a total price of $198,842. Um, Say aye if you approve this purchase. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. Item 7.8, which is pickup and van purchase. Yeah, as you know, we've done this um, about the last three years, but our fleet of maintenance vehicles are pretty old. The green ones that you see over there, and we've made them last quite a long time. Uh, we did the same kind of purchase would be two years ago now, a pickup and what I'd call a cargo van. Um, Last year, this year, we did not, but we went and bought, um, I'd call them utility-type vehicles, the four-wheelers for the high schools and, um, you know, so they can plow and, and uh, things at each of the high schools, uh, some of the secondaries, uh, middle schools, and so we've been doing that this year. So what we have for you right here is two of them, a pickup truck, a 3500 uh, 3, HD regular cab pickup, Todd Wenzel Buick of GM, GMC, excuse me, Westland, Michigan. That price is thirty-three thousand six hundred 
and $80.45. Um, that's going to replace a 93 Dodge that we have that has 115,000 miles on it. Uh, we also recommend the purchase of the cargo van. Uh, it's got a contractor package, which just means the back is arranged so we can have tools and things in there. That's signature Ford Lincoln of Owasso, Michigan, and that price is 33186 Again, that's replacing a box van, a 91 box van, um, with 149,000 miles on it. They're both using the state uh, My Deal bidding program, which is a state bid, the lowest prices we can get in the state. And so those purchases we made with funds from the 1920. So part of that budget we put together, we'll have the funds to do that. But you have to order uh, by the middle of May before our next board meeting if you want the vehicles in 1920. <clears throat> Okay, at this time I'll, op I'll be open to accept a motion for item 7.8. We'll make a motion to um, approve the purchase of the 2020 GMC Sierra and the 2019 Ford Transit van um, as outlined in 7.8. Support. Moved by Roush, support by Friedel, and we'll open it up for discussion. I was just going to ask, is there a reason to pay for this out of budget instead of the bond? Correct. Like why, why different on these two purchases than the bus? The bond did not cover okay. any vehicles up in our fleet besides the bus purchases going okay. forward, nor are you able to use bond funds for that okay. by law. Um, and, and we have built for this, so that, that was part of we've been planning all along to replace those vehicles in a timely manner. When I say timely manner, make sure you go back and look. It's 30-year-old vehicles, and so you know I'm pretty frugal with almost a 21 or 20-year-old. I'm pretty proud of that, but 30 is pretty amazing. And remember, these vehicles we don't wear them out necessarily on mileage, but it's you know 30 years of body in Michigan. And our, again, our mechanics do a great job. These bodies have probably been completely rebuilt by them. So I was going to say that Dodge was old when I worked for the schools <laughs> <laughs> as a, as a summer student driving that thing around. So. Yeah, we get good use out of our vehicles out there. So. And, and, and note the buses, um, 17, 18 years. Uh, typically, it's 12, 13, so they're doing a nice job out there. Okay, very good. All right, so we'll go and we'll vote for uh, approving um, the 2020 GMS Sierra 350 HD regular cab pickup truck and the Ford Transit 250 cargo van. Um, the first, uh, uh, sorry, the, the pickup truck was $33,680.45, and the Ford Transit cargo van, $33,186. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, and it passes unanimously. All right, now we are on to item eight, which is request to address the board. At this time, if there's anyone in the community who would like to address the board, uh, they can do so at this time. We have a new process. I don't know if you, you've noticed, but there's a uh, form. So we used to have every, have you say your name and address, but uh, we know that that's not always comfortable. So if you don't want to do that, there are forms that you can fill out and uh, leave on the board table, and then we'll have a way to contact you if you... And each speaker then has five minutes. Hi, uh, my name's Angie Kelleher. I live at 589 North Rustic Drive in Midland. Uh, I have two elementary age kids in Midland Public Schools. Um, I'd like to continue the conversation about how to improve diversity and inclusion and equity in our schools. I attended the last board meeting and I'm so grateful for the brave parents who spoke at, their, at that meeting about their students of color and the negative experiences they have had in Midland Public Schools. Some of you might be wondering why those students didn't report the incidents of racism. I'm not a person of color, but here are the few reasons which I can guess about. Um, one of them is lack of trust. Many people of color, when sharing their stories of racism with white folks, have been met with defensive, dismissive, or minimizing responses. They may have heard, oh, they were just joking, or I'm sure they didn't mean it like that, um, or I think you're overreacting. And after you hear that enough times, you might not have any reason to trust that the teachers and the administrators will believe you. 
Another reason is fear of being labeled as a problem student or a complainer. Many people of color at predominantly white institutions just want to keep their head down and try to fit in and get through the day as best they can. And they might think if they rock the boat, it might attract too much negative attention and it might not seem like it's worth it. The third reason might be not all racist acts are large things. People of color experience many small indignities every day. I know students who, when their teachers discuss slavery, every white student turned and looked at them. Students who have people constantly touching their hair, often without asking. Students who get asked, what are you, in reference to their race or ethnicity. Each of these individual acts may be minor, but when they build up over time, they become intolerable. The person who is the recipient of this behavior would be even more exhausted if they reported each incident each time. Those of you on the board who are women and have experienced sexism might be able to understand. Um, and maybe others of you have identities that have made you feel this way. Um, and remember, we're talking about kids here. They don't always even have the words to say why a certain incident is troubling to them. They just want the teachers and the administrators to recognize those behaviors and to stop them. So I want to recap two of the requests that those parents made at the last meeting. Um, one of them was that the Diversity and Inclusion Committee seek out and respond to the needs of minority students and their families. <clears throat> I believe that the District Diversity Committee, I think, has invited two people of color to join them, um, a teacher and a consultant. And now think back to what I just told you about why the students don't report always. Um, number one on that was lack of trust. Remember the stories that were shared at the last meeting by those parents. Those stories were extremely difficult for those parents to tell and you should view them as a sacred gift. Those parents don't owe us anything. It is on us to fix this system. However, they are willing to collaborate with us now on making our schools more inclusive and equitable. They want a seat at the table. They should be invited to either serve on the diversity committee or to be welcomed into some kind of periodic conversation at the district level or maybe within their local schools, maybe a parent's advisory board. I think inviting them to have these conversations now could go a long way towards demonstrating that MPS cares about this issue. Not when the committee has already decided what to do, but now. And if the committee is doing this work currently, I hope they understand that it is indeed ongoing work and that it will never be finished. One plan or one training are not enough. And one of the other points that those parents made is to plan more professional development for teachers and administrators. And I think that maybe since the last meeting, one teacher training has taken place, maybe more, and I'm grateful for that. Um, however, as I stated, this work must be ongoing. It takes much more than one afternoon to fully appreciate and understand all of the many steps that go into creating an inclusive and equitable school system. I noticed that further on in the agenda, there's a list of the proposals for staff development, and not one of those 15 proposals involves equity, diversity, and inclusion. So maybe there's an explanation for that. Maybe you'll talk about that. But if we do indeed value our marginalized students, maybe you could explain to me why that list does not include anything. Thanks. Thank you. Just on that topic, Pam, staff development and uh, trainings are two different. Um, issues, so that's why that is. Staff development is pure, purely tied to, to the curriculum development of teachers, that's all. Right. Okay, thank you. And Jennifer Vinette, 603 Coolidge Drive. Um, I didn't plan to speak tonight. I, I'm not prepared. I had, had no thought I was going to, but when I listened to the Prodigy students, they inspired me to just say another word, uh, continuing on this conversation that we're having about diversity and inclusion. And the young student said, was talking about the science and all that she didn't 
know existed until she's doing this experiment and, and how it opened her eyes and that excitement. That happens when we teach students about our history of racism as well. It's a hard topic, but it's still important. Um, over spring break, my family and a friend's family went to Montgomery, Alabama to specifically to go to the Legacy Museum and the Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is more commonly known as the lynching memorial. It was very powerful, very difficult. Um, it's a sacred space, and I do recommend that trip to see that. But what really impacted me was my kids and my friend's kids, who were ranging from high school to elementary. Uh, my son sat down on a bench in the museum, and he was just kind of slumped over. So I sat down next to him, and I, are you OK? And he said, Mom, I'm sad. And I said, yeah. Mom, this really happened. This isn't supposed to happen. People aren't supposed to do this. This is real. And I'm sure you know I talk about this stuff at home. I teach my kids. I don't just come yell at you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's still like he, being in that space brought more to him. Somebody not his mom talking about it made it more real. We need that from the school district. My friend's daughter noticed that a man had been lynched for standing in a white neighborhood. And through the rest of the trip, occasionally, we would hear her say, he was just standing there. It deeply impacts our students. They, they will get it. It's hard. But our white students are the only ones who don't really know and have an understanding of the history. And that's why it's so important that we make it a priority. And, and like the Prodigy Students t-shirts talked about, like education can change the world. Like we can make these students have the best chances in life, not just, not just because they're great at academics, which they are, but because we're teaching them how to be good citizens, how to be good neighbors, how to have empathy and see what has happened, not because we want to dwell in the negative, but because there's reconciliation in telling that truth. And we need that. So I do hope we continue to push forward with our diversity and inclusion, that there's more transparency about what's happening because there is confusion and people just want to know and people are clamoring to be part of the conversation, so let them in. There are skills, talents, experiences that can help shape that conversation. And I think the more open it is, the better off we all are because we can all learn from each other. I'm still learning. I know you're all still learning. I know you care because you're here. You dedicate your time to this. And we need to be able to pass that on to our students through curriculum, through to help our teachers, through professional development, um, all the levels. And it's going to be a long process. But think of the amazing reputation Midland Public Schools would have if we made that a priority and represented that to our entire state. So I ask that we continue. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. I'm short. I'm, I'm Judy McAtee, 2213 Westbury Drive in Middle Michigan. I have a question, I have more of an inquiry and an update. Um, it's my, um, I'm here speaking for myself as a clinical social worker in the f uh, in private practice here in Midland for over 27, eight years <laughs> since we moved here. And but I'm also here representing a very powerful, wonderful group of clinical and medical social workers in the Midland community. And it is our understanding that the schools are looking at grants or some funding to increase and, and bring on more social workers. Is that correct that that's happening, I, I believe, is what I heard at one of the other meetings? And so I've been asked lately if I would come in to just inquire and ask how that's going, 
how um, if they are indeed or if, you, if the school board is indeed looking at bringing in more social workers in my 30 almost 30 years here in Midland no question as the social workers and psychologists were decreased and the funding was cut for many of those in the schools there's absolutely no question that us in clinical practice in the community have seen an onslaught in our in our um, practices of students uh, being referred to us for issues within the school system, issues with anxiety, issues with diversity, uh, bullying, et cetera. Without question, I almost wish I would have done a study over those last years. So uh, in support, I hope that you are looking at some funding to bring back some of the social workers in the school and an inquiry as to where that is. Okay, thank you. Uh, normally when, when uh, we have our community speak to the board. They, it's a board meeting of, of the board, and then we invite the administrators here uh, to support us in that. And then if you, questions are directed toward me as board president. And then we don't usually respond back and forth um, in the open meeting. We get your information, and then we go to our only employee, Mr. Sherrill, and, and we can have that conversation with him. We'll, we'll contact her. I'm, I'm not sure where, where that actually is, um, but it's a very broad topic, so it's not probably exactly as presented as you presented, but there's money, state, federal, that are possible, but so I'm not sure. We need to get on the same page before that discussion occurs, and we'll, we'll contact and have that discussion. So, Thank you. Would anyone else like to come up and speak to the board? All right, thank you. Appreciate your participation. And um, at this point, we will move into item nine, which is curriculum instruction and assessment. We have uh, item 9.1, which is the study committee minutes. Who's got the minutes? Please? I've got them. Okay. Um, so on Monday, March 18th, um, Lynn Baker, myself, and Mary met um, with administration. And curriculum office administrators shared information about the staff development proposals and process and details of each proposal. The 17 proposals submitted for the 1920 school year address a diverse array of content areas that span grades pre-K through 12. The proposals advance the district's work in key areas such as uh, curriculum alignment, um, enhancing instructional practices, technology integration, open educational resources, social emotional learning, and STEM learning. At this meeting, uh, these proposals are presented for the information and public examination, and then they will, we will take action at the May board, meeting, board of Education meeting. Um, implementation will be based on the available funds in the 1920 budget. Um, we also met today at Midland High um, in the paths um, Learning Center and learned a lot more about that program that's offered at both Midland and Dow High. And then our next meeting is May 20th um, at the Building Trades um, House. So look very much looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, that's always one of the favorites. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Penny, if you would be able just to give us a little background on, on how the staff development proposals are come together. Absolutely. Um, and I'll just kind of fold in then the conversation about this year's under 9.2, since that's our next agenda oh, okay. item as well. Um, we do have uh, those proposals for your review tonight and for the 28-day public review period. These proposals are really put in motion in part by our curriculum office staff as we assess curricular needs in consultation with our teacher leaders and building leaders. So Mr. Sherrill was correct in saying that these are typically tightly connected with curricular initiatives, as you'll see by many of these titles. Uh, typically, you'll see that uh, we're charting out a few years in advance, knowing where we're at with a given initiative. So some of these are multi-year proposals. Uh, but they're based on need. And it's sometimes in response to changes at the state level when we see curricular shifts and changes there, sometimes in response to changes that we know we need to continue to make in terms of instructional practices as well. Uh, work hard to make sure that those are aligned to school improvement plans in each building uh, in addition to that. 
Are there more specific questions you have? No, that's I more so for mm -hmm. so our community understands um, that it's a process. It absolutely and, is, and that there's um, like you said, multi-year uh, programs that that we need to continue with, and then. Uh, aligning to the school improvement plan to me when I first came on the board um, I didn't realize there was all that work ahead of time when we came to a board meeting and saw this list and then now being on the board for five years and realizing that there's a lot of planning over years that happens to to ensure that um, we focus on the top priorities and that they align with our goals for the district and and that they align with that uh, school improvement process and then the district school improvement process. So, I will just add also, in addition to these activities, you know we have 30 hours of professional learning that we provide through the district as well as the building, and that calendar was just recent, re recently released and how we'll divide that time. Those also have strong alignment to school improvement plans and the district improvement plan. There is a little autonomy, autonomy in there for principals to make some decisions about their building professional learning. Uh, and there's always opportunities for us to offer um, voluntary options after school, which I think is the space that we um, will certainly utilize with some of our inclusion and diversity work. Very good. Thank you. You know, really, the one last thing on the inclusion diversity side of it is um, school years, whether you like it or not, are, they function in years. And so you yeah. prepare for the next year way ahead of time. And so some of the inclusion diversity work, uh, we're working on it on a regular basis, but we won't, we, we're not as fast moving as people would like. And so those, many of those things will be developed and be instituted in the year to come because we are very much winding down one year and very much winding up the next year, even though uh, people don't see it that way. They, you know, the traditional parent begins to think about the next school year this summer. We've been thinking about the next school year for six months. And so these, these staff development proposals, for example, are probably eight, eight, nine months back of work now. So that's part of what you see. So as we look at uh, item 9.2, I, I really don't have a whole lot more to add than what the uh, CIA committee minutes offered. I'll just offer for the point of clarification, those minutes suggested that we had 17 proposals. We do have a committee that meets to vet these proposals throughout the process before they make it to you tonight for information. And that committee, um, along in consultation with curriculum office staff, opted to drop two proposals. Part of that was alignment. Um, part of that was knowing we wanted to come in at a, a particular budget point as well. And we have capacity only to handle so many initiatives at once. So the number with you tonight is 15 proposals, and that total dollar figure coming from general fund is $184,000. $836. There is a secondary project lead the way proposal for a touch over 45,000 which will actually come from our STEM grant and that's one of those that's been in motion for a couple of years now and it's just that next natural progression. So these are for your information. Uh, they'll be recommended for your action at the May board meeting. We let all parties involved in this process know that this is certainly contingent upon final budget approval. So uh, these will begin after that approval is given after July 1. Great. Thank you for that update. All right, moving into item 10, which is finance facilities and operations. We have uh, meeting minutes. Ms. Friedel? Yes. Uh, at our last meeting, uh, present myself, uh, Scott, Pam, Mike Sharrow, Mr. Bruton, and Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee, the February financial reports, the purchase of the cafeteria tables for Adams Elementary, which we voted on today, approval of the five-year uh, food service contract with Chartwells, which we approved this evening, update on the sale of the Series 2 bonds, which we had a motion for approval tonight, um, and budget workshop and uh, current level of information from the state legislature on the funding, which we had an update about tonight. Um, employee compensation and staffing levels for 2019-2020 school year. And then summer facilities work outside of the bond. Our next uh, FFO meeting is on Monday, May 6th at 5 p.m. Great, thank you. 
Moving into item 10.2 for information, gifts, uh, Mr. Cooper. Yeah, under 10.2, we have 10 gifts tonight for $5,539.36 um, from many sources, but you'll see our PTOs, JPAC, some anonymous parents, um, the Midland Area Community Foundation Community Gives Program, and the Community Foundation Kellogg Youth Fund. Um, under 10.3, because of the size of the gifts, that does require your action. Uh, there's a $5,000 from the Dorothy Minkle uh, Endowment Fund that's held at the Midland Area Community Foundation. It goes for BPA and DECA, depending on which high school, um, and is used for the competitions. And then there's two, uh, it looks like two separate ones. They basically just came from two different sources. It's all from Chemical Bank for a total of uh, 80000 It's just the way they gave that to us, and that's for our new scoreboard at the stadium. Um, which is going to be installed here sometime as we're doing work over there. And um, you, that, those need your approval tonight just because of the size of the gifts. All right. I'll, I'll be open to accepting a motion for item 10.3. I move that we accept, uh, that we approve the gifts under item 10.3, totaling $85,000. Support. Motion by McFarland and supported by Fredell. Is there any discussion? Very cool. It's nice. always great to yeah. accept a gift, right? Thank you very much. And those competitions are really, really important for the kids that are in those um, CTE programs um, that they can compete in BPA and DECA. Absolutely. Okay, we'll move into a, a vote for item 10.3 for gifts totaling $85,000. All. In favor of accepting these gifts, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 10.4, which is, again, for information. Yep, for information only. We, besides getting monetary donations, we get gifts of items. Um, shows the diversity of what we get here. We've got a console upright piano um, donated. And we also have dental kits for the elementary and middle school students um, that were given. So it doesn't require any action on your part. Just gifts of items as opposed to monetary. Very good. Thank you. And we'll move into item 11 for human resources. Um, we have item 11.1, .1, which is staff members announcing their retirement. Did yep. you want to take that? I'll take that for you. Sure. Um, for retirement announcements, we have Mr. Alan Chappell, a uh, teacher at Midland High, who will be retiring on June 13th, uh, 2019. And if you don't mind, I'll take 11.2 as well, too. We have condolences to pass along to two families this evening. First, the family of Mr. Thomas Lawton, who passed away on March 14th, 2019. Mr. Lawton was a custodian at MPS for 26 years, retiring in 2004. And then next to the family of Mr. William Johnston, who passed away on March 25th. During his 32 years with MPS, Mr. Johnston worked with students and staff at Jefferson, Midland High, and Dow High, as an administrator and teacher in industrial education, yearbook, and graphic arts, Mr. Johnson retired in 1997. Thank you. Our deepest sympathies going out to that, those families. Item 12 is correspondence to and from the Board of Education, letters to, uh, from the Board of Education. And item 12.2 is for information, letters to the Board of Education. Um, and then we'll move into item 13, which is just a list of scheduled activities. And our final uh, item is item 14, study discussion session. So I'll open it up to Brad. Um, just wanted to say thank you again to our shining stars, Joanna and Michael. Um, thanks for the presentation on the Prodigy from Kurt and Tracy and Elizabeth and all of the children, all the students, it was, it was, that was great. Um, thanks again to all the volunteers, 3,600 volunteers and especially our star volunteers. Um, and thank you to Angie, Jennifer, and Judy for speaking to us tonight. That's it. Thank you. I have nothing to add to that. It all right. Well said. Thank you, Brad. Um, I just wanted to say uh, congratulations to the winners of the A.H. Uh, Nicholas Innovation Awards. The 
first and third places went to MPS uh, Midland High students, and that's uh, money goes to our our school or Midland High as well for STEM education. So it's kind of a quick turnaround of you know we provide the basics and the kids take it and run with it. So that was really really cool. Um, also the uh, another show of our STEM uh, prowess with the. Uh, both the high school robotics teams placing and going on to the is it nationals world 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 competition so kudos to all those guys awesome job thanks um so we got to see prodigy today which really addresses the top end of our students but mary and i got to visit paths this afternoon at, at midland high and see um the curriculum that we've set up for 95 at-risk students in high school and it was an amazing discussion with one of the young men that are in the program right now and it it proved to me that we are putting every single student first and and you know to build on what we got to see today from prodigy the same individual treatment is given to the bottom end of our students and it it was I was blown away with with that young man and what that program has done for him um, and you can tell that the administration and staff are totally dedicated to that program and you know when when we were talking about the budget earlier today you know we we are at the bottom in spending of overhead and business administration and it continues to just prove to me that Mike and, and your staff are putting students first and, and we just see it exemplified in in multiple multiple ways so thank you well said well said um, well I won't repeat anything but I'm I budget season is exciting to me to kind of watch this whole process unfold and now with a new governor and a new legislature <coughs> um, just to, to see how this is going to unfold and and I've I'm optimistic and I and I hope that uh, we do see some of the the, the positive uh, investments in our school uh, come to fruition April 22nd uh, Mike set up a meeting with uh, our Senator Thomas and Representative Glenn and, and uh, I appreciate uh, him reaching out and setting that up um, just so we have the opportunity to have those conversations that I, I think are so important so um, thank you for that and I'll hand it over to you. Speaking of exciting, we have two new administrators coming to us soon. And so um, last week we announced Tracy Speaker Gersteimer as our new principal at Midland High School. And let everything I could find on our well-vetted principal that we're going to be very excited to have Tracy here. And so um, coming from a long way from Texas, I know I did that 25 years ago. Made that trek back home after 10 years down in Lone Star State. Tracy's doing basically the same thing, coming back for family. She's from the Midland area, knows the Midland area, spends time here every summer on her breaks. And so um, she's had a very good background. I'm working on a PhD, and I think she'll be a great fit for us. Adams Elementary, we're going to announce today that Tila Sherman will become our New Adams Elementary principal. We all know Tila. She came from Arizona and moved moved back to Michigan, and um, has been here as our Jefferson Middle School principal. Served on a number of community organizations for us. Um, I think uh, instructionally she'll lead Adams forward as well. So two exciting ones there. Um, legislative update. I won't go into a lot of that since we a lot of it's budget season. Uh, burning on everyone's minds, uh, uh, obvious snow days, which we dodged one again today, so that was wonderful, right? So um, I pretty much had my mind made up. I was going to get up and look anyway, and we were going to school. So, um, <laughs> so uh, we should know, it sounds like by end of the week, maybe next week, if they are going to make action on any of those um, the governor's declared emergency days. And that number has finally been narrowed down to um, five. It could be up to five. And so um, we would be able to knock our three makeup days off if that occurs. But there is a stalemate there. And so um, legislators are, the governor would like all hourly workers to be paid um, during for all those days. And the legislators saying leave that up to local control contracts. And so 
someone's got a blank there before that it's going to move forward and we'll see what happens on that I think it will because some of the, not so much us but there are those districts that are about 20 days out that they probably got to give a little relief to so we'll see what happens hold your breath we still right now are going to school on the 10th 11th 12th so we'll see what happens uh, retention um, in third grade with the reading initiative is a topic that's going on in the state um, they passed that legislation maybe didn't think that all the way through um, they're getting close to a year out and we still really don't know how they're gonna release that data how that's gonna be retained um, I think retention may stay uh, but I think the piece that may change is right now the letter to parents about their child not doing well and the recommendation of retention comes from an organiza state organization called CEPI Center for Educational Performance and Index and um, we we as um, educators are saying no 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 don't do that that should come from us locally and I think we may win at least on that piece going forward the other piece that's being talked about and has been for a couple of years is this is the year that um, evaluations moved to 40% of student performance which you did mine in January and it was based on 40% because that's the best known we have um, with with maybe a week or two left for them to make action in order for this to be done before uh, educators uh, evaluations are done there is some discussion they may go to 25% if I was betting on that one Brian would say yes I would say no so we're, <laughs> Brian and I disagree on that one maybe but um, so we'll see what happens we, we are planning 40 and if, and if it's in the next week or two we still can make the change to 25% and make that work so um, House Senate and I mentioned are looking at a joint budget which is probably good instead of having three budgets out there it's for a good thing going forward um, construction season is starting and um, you've seen a bunch of that at Adams it's a little bit messy over there right now um, the media centers at the secondary are going under construction and being pulled early as well as a few other areas of the buildings um, going on in the secondary buildings um, we also have a lot of work that we're going to do this summer with our, our own capital improvements. Isn't that amazing? We finally got to the point where we got a capital improvement fund again. And so you'll see seal coating of parking lots, the ones that make sense to do. Um, some work on um, carpenter, element, carpenter preschool playground, some other things like that going out the district. Um, uh, air units on the second floor of Northeast, we'll see if they actually can control that heat up there as well. So there's some things we're investing at in, in those parts of it. Series 2 bond sale, we did very, very well. Our borrowing costs were estimated to be 3.38, and we closed at 3.89. 3, 3 Did I write that the right direction? Yeah, I think. Yeah, is it higher the better on that one? Yes. I think I wrote it reverse. I think I wrote yeah. it in reverse. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, that, it sounds like small numbers, but over the, that bond sale, I can't remember, it, it's hundreds of thousand dollars that we save taxpayers on that so part of it was our bond rating going high because of that general fund um, going forward and the other one we caught the perfect day they said and part of it was that the feds had just announced that they won't need as many rate increases this year as they originally thought and bonds just took off on that day in fact we sold them before it actually they had they had them accounted for buyers accounted for every bond before it actually was, hit the uh, market I think it was 168 we were selling 40 million and there was demand for 168 million within the first when it opened. Wow! So no discounting them to get them sold or anything like that. It was done. So that was good news. And we are Pam's going to talk about this going to close session because we have agreement with our Masespa group, and um, we'll educate you on what that agreement is tonight. They have to ratify um, later in the month, and then we'll bring it back in May for you to actually take the final vote. So we need to go in closed session to update you on negotiations. Right. Okay, before we go into closed session, um, I just <coughs> want to say two more things. Um, and then what we do is we go into closed session and then we come back and we just adjourn. So that way, if you want to hang around and see us adjourn, that's fine. But if you don't, um, <laughs> that's really fine fun. too. So tonight, uh, the, the board was gifted with these special flowers from Chestnut Hill. Lainey brought these to us and uh, she has a note here chestnut hill is scattering kindness throughout the community in the fall spanish students created a collaborative display inspired by pablo picasso dub pablo picasso's dub of peace you are fine thank you no. That's all right. 
<laughs> That's all right. We get to see the Prodigy shirts up close. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Just one more. Oh, I don't think you want me to move in. That might be okay. All right, all right. <laughs> Thanks again, girls. So yes, thank, thank you so you. much for, a great for the kindness gift. And then the last thing is we received this wonderful book from Woodcrest, and they were so thrilled with their media center that everyone in school signed the book, and they wrote, we love the new media center. It is spacious, room for events, new, comfortable, luxurious furniture, organized better, and more shelving for separate, easy reader bridge fiction. More new books, new technology, self-service kiosk, big screen, new TVs, artwork, separate workspaces, stadium seating for story time, quiet, peaceful place to work. So it, what, a, what a gift to have all the kids um, sign this book. So uh, very special. Yeah, they, I think they appreciate everything the community has invested in and uh, the work that's being done over there. So that's exciting. All right, at this time, I will accept a motion to move into closed session. I make the motion we move to closed session. For, for do I have to stay with yep, for? Yep. For the. Assessment contract. Yeah, good. What's that? My assessment. My assessment contract. Okay. Support. <laughs> All right, moved by <laughs> Fredell, support by uh, McFarland. Uh, and we'll go into closed session for the tentative agreement with the Midland City Educational Support Personnel Association. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. I aye. should have just said the whole schmear. Yeah. <laughs>